Now when you start off with 3D printing, you're going to start off with the essentials. You're going to have Allen keys, you're going to have some flush cutters, you probably have some blue tape. However, as you spend more time in the hobby, there's going to be a lot of quality of life improvement things you're going to want to pick up. So as somebody who's been involved with 3D printing now for several years and who's built and maintained several 3D printers, I'm going to go over some of the essentials that I would recommend that you look into if you are serious about 3D printing as a hobby. So we're going to start off with the good old fashioned Allen keys. Now, when you get your first 3D printer, odds are it's going to come with some really bad Allen keys that'll probably strip the screws that you use to build the printer with, but they are good enough. I do recommend going out and getting a proper set of Allen keys, but odds are you've probably done that by now. However, one thing that I've been putting off for years and finally got around to doing was getting myself an electric screwdriver. Now, I've been trying two of these for the past few weeks now. Um, I have a Sequire. ES-126 and I have a WOW stick. Both of these were sent to me from Banggood for testing and evaluation. Um, all the reviews and opinions are my own, of course. And after using these now for several weeks, I, looking back at myself like an idiot for not picking one of these up sooner. Well, you can get pretty good and pretty fast with a standard set of Allen keys. When you're building printers from scratch and installing a hundred something M3 screws, um, having the aid of an electric motor is uh, quite handy. Now I've been using both of these now for a while and I do have some recommendation. Now while you can go cheaper and get something like a wow stick which does work quite well for driving the screws in you'll find that for tightening them it really doesn't have the torque. I find myself using the ES-126 more and more simply because it does have the torque to fasten some of the larger screw sizes and by larger I mean M3. M5 you're still going to want to hand tighten after. Also on the ES-126 you have different adjustments for how much torque you want to apply and it does work by motion so you simply push a button, one button activates it with a light and one without a light and then by twisting either left or right that controls your movement forward and backwards. The wow stick is much simpler. It's simply a button for forward, a button for reverse. The battery doesn't last quite as long and by weight, it does feel a lot lighter. Now there's always the bigger brother of the electric screwdriver and that is an electric drill. Now, you probably have one of these. If you do not, you're probably gonna want one anyways around the house. They come in handy, but tied to an electric drill, get yourself a set of drill bits. Uh, metric if you can, because most things in 3D printing are metric, but get yourself an actual set of drill bits. A good drill index will come in handy, especially when you're printing objects that need to fit together or fit screws through. You'll find a lot of designs that are out there aren't really designed for certain plastics in mind or they don't have the correct screw holes. I see a lot where somebody designs a hole for an M3 screw and they make an M3 hole. Obviously size for size, it's not gonna fit and then you over extrude a little bit, it's not gonna go through. So getting yourself a good drill index will definitely help a lot when it comes to reaming out those holes. And also, taps. Get yourself a tap handle and a tap set. These come in very handy whenever you have plastic parts with threading, as this will allow you to clean up the threads so that when you insert a screw into them, it's gonna go in much more smoothly and less risk of damage and cracking the plastic part. Also, if you're building 3D printers or you're working with aluminum extrusions, having taps on hand to either tap untapped holes or clean up the threads in a tapped hole is a much better alternative than forcing your screw in, causing it to seize or causing more potential damage. So tap handles, tap set, drill index, these are some things that you're gonna to wanna to pick up if you are especially building 3D printers a lot or doing a lot of maintenance or modifications to your 3D printers. Now, a soldering iron is something you'll probably wanna pick up at some point as well. This right here is a cheap $15, I believe, Amazon special. And for most use cases, this is honestly good enough. Uh, most of the time I still use this as my heat set installation soldering iron and you can attach wires and whatnot but you're not going to be working on pcbs really with something like this if you do intend to do more soldering or board repair or modifications you are going to want to get yourself a better soldering iron um, i myself personally use a ts100 there's all kinds of different good soldering irons out there hacko has the fx 888 i believe is another common one there's other styles such as this um, I like these styles because you can get replacement tips for it that include the heater, they heat up very quickly, and in a pinch you can actually run these off a battery. That's very handy if you're into drones and quads as well as 3D printing. It's a common hobby that has a lot of people in both. 
And then while we're talking about electronics, get yourself a multimeter. These are invaluable when it comes to troubleshooting and repairing 3D printers. Nothing is worse than having a dead wire and not knowing which wire it is. Being able to meter out your wires, find out which wires have break in them, make sure you have continuity between connections, being able to check your voltages, being able to verify that the heater that you bought off AliExpress that is unlabeled is 24 volts and not a 12 volt. Now you don't need to go out and buy a fluke. Uh, the one I use is a Mastercraft one. I don't even know how old it is because I found it in a toolbox in the house that I bought. But it works, it's good enough, and for what you need for 3D printing, just go get a basic one. Now this right here, every time this comes up in a video, somebody asks me what it is and where do I get it? This is a nozzle torque wrench. Go on Thingiverse, search torque wrench. This comes up, you can print it in multiple different ratings. These are invaluable whenever you're swapping nozzles. Now your printer probably comes with, and you probably have several of these by now, but they're cheap little wrenches for removing your nozzle. Now these are horrible. Nozzles are made out of brass mostly and other soft materials. So if you don't have good purchase on it, these are very easy to strip and destroy your nozzle with. You're gonna to wanna to use a socket. This fully envelops the nozzle. You're gonna get more contact on it. You're gonna be able to put more torque when you loosen it without potentially damaging the nozzle. And with a torque wrench, you'll always be able to torque it to the correct spec. Depending on your hot end, the manufacturer usually states how much torque is required to properly seat the nozzle. So you can buy nozzle torque wrenches or you can print one. I've been using this one for several years now. Um, the spec for this one is PETG. However, if you print it in ABS, you can compensate by printing it at a different rating. So this one is 1.5 Newton meters printed in ABS. I use it on all my nozzles and I don't have any leak issues. Get yourself one of these. You'll be thankful for it later. Now, when it comes to filament storage, I'm lucky, my basement is relatively dry. I have central air conditioning in my house, so my house is fully climate controlled. I don't really have moisture issues. Because of that, I can leave PLA and ABS out in the open here in my basement, and I've left spools out for years without mo moisture issues. However, not all plastics are as good with moisture as others. For example, nylon. Nylon is very hygroscopic, so it's gonna suck up that moisture. Now you can go ahead and build dry seal containers and I used to use those. However, I found that they were more of a pain. Things tend to get buried. You're always opening and closing to dig it out. I've since moved to using these airlock bags. These are resealable bags with a little pump for sucking the air out. So now when I'm using my nylons or polycarbonates or other plastics that have a tendency to suck up moisture, after I remove them from the dry bin that I print out of, I'll go ahead and seal them up. These bags are fully reusable and they stay airtight. So this is how I store my plastics that are more prone to moisture absorption. And I've found that these actually work a lot better at keeping the plastics drier than a large dry bin tote. Now, unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world and there are times when plastics are gonna absorb moisture and you're gonna have to dry them out. To resolve that, you're gonna have to get yourself a filament dryer. Now, you can buy dedicated standalone filament dryers. However, I'm not really a huge fan of them as the purpose-built standalone ones usually don't fit all spool sizes. You can get all kinds of odd size spools for different types of plastics. I use a modified dehydrator that you can buy these on Amazon or go to a thrift store. I've seen these for as low as $10. And really you don't need a really good high-end one because you're gonna modify it anyways. Most of them have these little rings, cut out the grill in the middle, usually a tall enough stack once they're all in with the lid you can fit a spool or two in these and you can easily modify them to be larger it does have multiple temperature settings as well and this is my $20 filament dryer that I use for any time I got to dry something out now after the filaments dry it either goes right into a dry bag or I can put it into my dry box that feeds my printer that I print my fancy materials on and this right here is a countertop offcut this is a super handy super invaluable thing if you're serious about building 3d printers or you're looking for something to rest your printer on that is very heavy and dense now a precision surface plate this is not however it is a very flat surface that you can get for relatively cheap to even free call around or go to a local countertop manufacturer ask if they have any off cuts most local manufacturers I've found will be happy to sell you or even give away old offcuts or scrap pieces because they're usually of a small size that they can't really do anything with them for countertops. So you can get the cutouts from sinks, for example, or end pieces 
for a very reasonable price. Now the piece I have is quartz and I actually picked it up for $20. And while it is not a precision surface plate, it's not gonna be accurate to a tenth of a thou across the whole thing, it's most likely gonna be flatter than any other surface in your house. And when you're building a 3D printer, especially when you're lining up extrusions, having a flat surface to start off with is definitely gonna help with aligning things later on. Now you do wanna get quartz, you don't wanna get granite. Granite has a tendency to absorb oils so get a quartz one. And after you've built your printer on it, you can also use it as a surface for the printer to rest on. A common trick with 3D printers is to rest your 3D printer on a cement paver on top of foam to help vibration dampen. You can also use the countertop offcut for that as well. A nice offcut of quartz looks a little bit better than a granite paver in your bedroom. And the last thing I'm gonna cover today is a scale. Go get yourself a cheap kitchen scale, uh, digital, so you can swap between ounces and grams and any other uh, weight you want to check things in. It's one of those things that you won't need often, but when you need it, it'll be nice to have. The most common use you'll see people use these for with 3D printing is weighing your spools. Most spools are sold by the kilogram of filament. So when you buy a new spool, put it on your scale and weigh the entire spool. If the spool weighs 1.25 kilograms, for example, you know that the empty spool weighs 250 grams. So write 250 grams on the spool. And then later on, after you've done a few prints and you wanna know how much filament is left on it, put it on your scale, weigh it, minus 250 grams, and that's how much filament you have left on the spool. It's also handy if you're designing or building things and you just wanna know how much something weighs. So just pick one up when you see one on sale at Walmart or whatever, and just keep it on hand for when you need it. So this video covered some of the beyond essential things that I use a lot when it comes to 3D printing. I hope this gave you some ideas on things you should pick up or to add to your current uh, selection of tools to help improve your workflow and your quality of life when it comes to 3D printing. As always, if you have any questions, make sure you ask them in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you like that smash button. And if you would like to see more content such as this, make sure you are subscribed to the channel. I hope you learned something new today. And as always, have yourselves a great day. Thank you.